Hello and welcome back to Multimodal. I'm your host, Back to the Future. This is a podcast about large language models, multimodal AI models. Uh, this is a podcast about the company Co here, switching it up this time. Uh, we got a special guest. Uh, you know, normally, you know, I talk about different uh, community initiatives that are going on, different things going on in the space. I try to look at the world from the perspective of a large language model developer or perhaps a multimodal artist. And every once in a while, I throw out their guests, extrapolate on what all of this could mean for the future. Uh, this is definitely not a podcast about today. This is a podcast about tomorrow. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Multimodal. We have a very, very special guest today on the podcast. Uh, we have Nick Frost here, AI researcher, uh, you know, very successful musician, uh, just on the side. Uh, he's you know now a pivoted entrepreneur, co-founder, CTO of Cohere. He's in the building. He's entered the podcast building. Uh, and of course, uh, Cohere is, you know, a later natural language processing, large language model AI company based in Toronto. So uh, that's something Nick and I have in common. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Nick, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, thank you so much for, for having me. It's great to talk to you. Thanks so much for the hype. It's a great introduction. It makes me feel great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy, to be, happy to be here and excited to talk about large language models. Awesome. Uh, yes, hype, hype is what I bring. <laughs> To, to the table, uh, I have hype-like tendencies. I've discussed this with my friends, uh, but I hopefully, hopefully, we'll get a, a healthy dose of skepticism today too, Nick. So, uh, just to start with, so we want to get to know you a little bit. Uh, how did how did you get into AI? What, what's the story here? And by my understanding, uh, you know, from what I read online, is kind of it was kind of serendipitous. So, did you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I've been in, I've been interested in AI for for a while now. Um, but I first got, I got my first like opportunity in AI, um, when I was an undergrad and I was working at a, at uh, snakes and lattes in Toronto actually, which is a, a board game cafe. And I, uh, met a guy named Eris who, uh, who I started talking to about like the computability of board games, of various abstract strategy board games. And he told me I should go meet a professor called John Sotsos who worked on computer vision. Uh, at York University, and I did, and uh, he turned out to be great and really nice, and offered me a position like just helping out with research uh, at York. So that was my first little research gig, and I loved it. Had a really great time working there, and then just kept on looking for other opportunities to do research, and I've been doing that for a while now. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. And to give some context, uh, Snakes and Lattes is like a very common date spot in Toronto. It's a very common group spot uh you're gonna bring you're gonna bring shorty to snakes and lattes um yeah, when i was working there like the, this a huge number of people would come on their first dates and either it would go really well because yeah. they like find commonality in the games they were playing yeah. or you yeah. could see a few first dates that just went terribly and they sat awkwardly across each yeah. other from guess who and like made no yeah. made no connection yeah or they're like you know just like arguing over or and wait yeah. to kill time right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over the rules of the games they're playing. Yeah, it's a yeah, good yeah. Spot. I there a lot. It's yeah, I, you know, I definitely for for bigger groups. So a little little Toronto, little Toronto tidbit for people listening. Um, so then, you know, at, at some point, you know, you know, through through this academic sort of wave that that you were on already, you know, going with the flow, uh, you know, you met Jeffrey Hinton. You were closely with him. Uh, I guess to start with, tell us about some of the research research stuff that that, that you've done, and obviously, you know contributed in a huge way to, to the space. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I, I certainly a lot of that was just from the good the good fortune and luck of being able to work with him. Um, and Sarah Sabor, who's another co-author of mine at Google. Um, yeah, so while I was at Google with both, both of them, I worked on vision stuff for a while. So we worked on a few capsule network papers. Um, and then I got really interested in adversarial examples for a while um, and like ways in which you can like things that illustrate that neural nets behave in ways we don't really expect them to. And that was why I was interested in the adversarial example literature. Um, I did some other stuff on just like on, on representation learning. So it's kind of all over the map there for a little bit. Um, but then, yeah, got, got excited about, you know, doing something useful and like, you know, building, building something where the, you know, the output of my work at the end of the day is not uh, counting the number of citations in Google Scholar, which, which was super enjoyable for a while, but got, a, you know, gets a little, gets a little grating and I wanted instead the output of my work to be like, you know, building something that, that people use and that people are find useful. Um, so I left Google 
to start Cohere with, with Aiden and Ivan. And that was about two and a half years ago, I think, yeah. So That's awesome. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of uh, maybe some mystery around Jeffrey Hinton, also Toronto-based. Uh, did, did you want to uh, talk a bit, like, what, what's he like? What's he like in person, uh, you know, as, as a friend, as a mentor? Yeah, uh, yeah, he's, he's excellent. He's, he's amazing. He's one of my, yeah, I really, uh, he's, a, he's, a really, he's a really dear friend of mine, and I really look up to and respect him, and have, I've learned a ton from him. Yeah, he's, 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 he was excellent. Like, I worked at Brain with him for three years, and that was, like, how I learned to do good neural net research, like, just through 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 him um, and the other people there he yeah, was a great team that he built around him so yeah no really, really excellent guy I got nothing but nothing but good things to say but he's also a lot funnier than he comes off like he's actually he's, he's actually very funny uh, but that takes like a little bit to get there yeah yeah that's awesome and uh, so I take it you started Cohere so we're sort of sort of building a narrative here so you started Cohere I guess in terms of a bigger impact uh, maybe applying a lot of the research stuff that was going on um, w were there other reasons why you started it? Well, yeah, I mean, people have asked this question before, like, you know, why did I start a company? And there's like, maybe there's a few answers to that question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one of them is like, I, I don't know if I'd say having bigger impact, but just having different impact. Like I just wanted, you know, like it was really fun to publish papers and do that. But the academic, you know, being in academia is kind of, it's complicated and it's got its own problems. And it's, it's kind of nice to at some point say like, okay, I don't want my output to be a paper. I want my output to be a thing, like a tool that people can use. I got it. Um, you know, the other reason for starting Cohere was that, you know, we, you know, we saw this opportunity in the market. Like there, it happens to be the case that really big language models are better at a whole bunch of tasks than small models on any of those individual tasks. And that means it's a good opportunity for a company like us to come around, make really good language models and only make good language models and make those accessible to other companies who want to use them. So there's like an opportunity there that, you know, that we saw. And then the third reason is just that I wanted my life to be more chaotic and I had the, you know, the good fortune to be able to take on that chaos at the time. You know, like I was able to take that risk and, 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 and willing to, to jump. So I had, you know, the opportunity and the ability to do it and then jumped and did it. And it's been pretty fun since then. Awesome. Uh, did you at the time feel seismic shifts were happening? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I would argue maybe there was a more of like a research to perhaps commercialization uh maybe there's some scaling growth underpins did, did you yeah. did you feel something like that or was it just you yeah. just did what you felt was right at the time no we totally like it you know it we totally were thinking about the fact that the best language models are going to be you know prohibitive for the average developer to certainly create and even at this stage deploy Right? Like you just can't, like if you want to use a state of the language art, state of the art language model, your computer is not big enough to hold, to hold it in memory. And that's a really like that, you know, it didn't have like, that's kind of, that was surprising to me. Like when I was doing, or I, when I started doing work on machine learning and neural nets, I did all my, all my experimentation was on MNIST models. And it wasn't obvious to me that scale was like going to be something that really changed, that gave, that gave language models new abilities. And because it did turn out to be that way, there's an opportunity for a company like us to exist. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so part of it is also you guys are developers. And so you want to make something that you would want to use. So there's yeah. that element as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and I do that all the Like I spend mm -hmm. a lot of my time at Cohere these days just building stuff with our own API. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. Yeah, part that because it's yeah. part that's because it's like you know a good way of convincing myself that what we're building is useful. Mm -hmm. A good way of like this way I know exactly what we're good at, what we're bad at, mm -hmm. and the other you know reason for doing that is just that it's really fun. <laughs> and yeah, I still yeah. just get to build stuff with this API all yeah. the time, and that's great. Yeah. So, yeah. And and tell us, Nick, is it is it well illustrated? Would you describe the illustrations while you're building stuff in the documentation? Are they top tier? Would you say that? I would, yes. I would say yeah. that our, our illustrated tr transformers are top tier these days. Uh, yes, thanks to yes. Jay, thanks to Jay's work, yeah. Yeah, uh, you should, it's, it's almost like you should take him and put a t-shirt on him and send him around the world to do, like I don't know, like some kind of tour <laughs> because his illustrations are straight fire. Uh, shout out to Jay. Yeah. Shout out to Jay. Shout out to uh, Jay. Yeah, wait, just, uh, just to give your, your listeners the backstory on that, there's a, a Jay Alomar is, is known for... 
yeah, illustrating and explaining neural nets really, really well. We hired him. He's amazing. He writes all yeah. the documentation, and he recently yes. went on a world tour to speak and talk about it. It was great. So we made him a show. Which is an incredible inside. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna love the inside inside jokey today, Nick. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, it's like, it's like uh, baseball for us. Yeah, really yeah. Uh, and so, okay, so that's awesome. Um, and so, help us understand more about Code here. Like, what, what do you guys offer? Uh, what do you guys do differently when it comes to large language models? Um, I, I, I'm, I can expand a little bit more. I, I am interested in like maybe more opinionated kinds of AI models. You know, different kinds of approaches, uh, especially with the open source stuff. A lot of it is starting to feel the same. Um, so, like, uh, it's nice to see innovation. It's nice to see people try new things, take different approach. Uh, you know, style things differently. You know, uh, mm -hmm. like you guys are doing in the playground. So, I guess the, I guess the question is like, you know, what what does Cohere do really, really well? What are you guys doing differently? And who's a, who's a good fit for Cohere to mm -hmm. use? Who's a good target customer, or target user today? For sure. Yeah, I think the thing that we're, you know, the space we're trying to carve out and the thing we're, or where we're trying to add value is in making large language models really easy to use to solve real world problems. Like we're trying to make it so that if you're a developer in some company and you're like, you know, you have some language problem somewhere, we want you to be able to come to Cohere and have a language solution based on transformers. Um, it's, you know, there's like lots of, the space is filled with lots of great companies. Like, you know, Hugging Face is an excellent company and they've done a huge amount of good for the research community for people's ability to like come in download a model tinker with the architecture try various things out like change the weights around change the learning function retrain like you know all these little things and we're trying to like make something that's for people who just want to have the solution they just want to come to cohere and they want to classify text as like you know is this a question or not a question like something like, simple like that or they want to they want to take a bunch of documents and they want to extract the name of the person in that document or something simple uh, like that. And we're trying to make that really easy and funded. So that's the, that's the, that's the goal here is to make, like, you've got a language problem, Cohere's got a language solution for you. And that's the, that's right. the goal. And largely, largely developer first, right? Like the goal here mm -hmm. is developers, side projects, developers at startups, developers at big companies that, it, you know, from there it, it goes up the chain basically, yeah. right? But uh, yeah, and there's definitely a, definitely a funness to it, right? Like I, you know, with, with a lot of the stuff that I do, like I, I encourage people to just have fun uh, with mm -hmm. the tool. And I, I think like it's kind of an essential ingredient, right? Um, totally. And then and that's, that, I mean, that's one of the cool things about being in AI and neural nets. Like even if you're not super excited about, you know, machine learning as a, as a researcher, or you don't want to like stay up to date on the most recent paper, like working with these models is fun. Like they do cool stuff and they do stuff you don't expect sometimes. And there's like always, yeah. So we, we try to try to make it a fun developer experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and a lot of that is just in the model, you know, like it's just the, the model has to be good. The proof is in the pudding. Uh, people have fun with the model and then maybe, you know, then they start building the tool around it. So ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, so my opinion, uh, Cohere between January of this year and now, the underlying model, uh, especially the largest, is it XXL or XL? Extra large. X, X large right now, yeah. Two X's? One X right now. One X, one X, okay. <laughs> uh, that's coming. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, with with extra large, it has improved significantly uh, since yeah. when I tried it earlier this year and now. And I'd sort of covered the announcement and I'd sort of, uh, it, as a part of the initial email, uh, it was mentioned that uh, it's going to keep getting better. And yeah. I've also noticed like there's some timestamps, I believe, in the model names as well. Yeah. So I guess uh, this question is like, um, uh, what what sort of got you to this point where the language model is, is just a lot better? And is there something different going on in the training pipeline, the architecture of the model? Uh, you know, what what's sort of some of the some of the things you guys are putting into to extra large, which has allowed it to uh, gets so much better over such a short amount of time. Yeah, yeah, no, it's way better now than when it was six months ago and way, way better than where it was a year ago. And it will be way better six months from now. Like we're just always gonna be making the model better. And when I say making the model better, I mean like making the model better equipped to solve real world problems. Like that's specifically what we're, what we're targeting. And that's, and, um, and we do that by iterating on a whole bunch of things. We iterate on the data, 
we iterate on uh, like heuristics we use for filtering data. Um, we iterate on you know just hyperparameters and scale of model and all these things like that. There's we're not doing anything. You know we're not. There's no like we haven't come up with a new architecture and not told anybody. You know like we don't have a secret transformer 2.0. The like you know we haven't we haven't shared with yeah. the research community. Yeah. Um, the reason why it's getting better is just that you know these things are really difficult to make, um, and you have to be meticulous. You have to really like evaluate the data. You have to really iterate on hyperparameters. You, know, you have to get great compute and spend a bunch of time making sure that it's optimized. So you can train long enough. Like it's just there's a there's a huge there's a world of difference between reading the attention is all you need paper and mm -hmm. implementing uh, you know a really large language model and doing so well. And we're just always working on making that yeah. better. Yeah. So first of all, I'm really glad you've noticed that they've gotten better. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's, that's nice yeah. to hear. Yeah, obsession is all you need. Uh, and like, yeah. And uh, by the way, like I, I, you know, I haven't done this on the podcast before. Um, between January and now, uh, I'm I'm absolutely recommending Cohere's solution to everybody listening on the channel to say to say multimodal by Baxter Future first. Uh, but I feel like, you know, you guys have really been grinding. And I think when I evaluate a model, uh, the proof is in the pudding. And so I'm, I'm really starting to feel it. I encourage everybody listening to to absolutely go check out Cohere. Uh, I have some go to prompts as well. Uh, if you know, for people listening, try some of the stuff that you already might do elsewhere. Uh, plug it in and see how it goes. I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, now, I mean, thanks a lot, man. That, yeah. means, that means a lot to me. That's great. Thank okay. you. Yeah, and, and keep it up. Uh, keep it up. Uh, so, yeah, I, I try to uh, honestly give props on the podcast. You know, sometimes it's constructive. You know, most of the time it's 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 props. So, um, but so to get back to the question though, like I guess I'm hearing there's a lot more. I guess you guys have built an infrastructure which allows you to iterate. I think I think that's that's what I'm hearing, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, maybe yeah. That's yeah. We spend a lot of time like just building up frameworks. Like we have an awesome engineering frameworks team that just iterates on making models better. Yeah, we have a team that works on on stuff, getting those models ready for inference. We have a team working on the generative models, on the embedding models. Like, there's just a ton of people spending a lot of time and trying and working really hard to make mm -hmm. the models better. Um, mm -hmm. And the, yeah, the fruits of their labor is is paying off and and visible in like the, the benchmarks that we've released on our model cards and stuff like that. Awesome, awesome. Um, and so, what are some of the behind-the-scenes challenges of training and scaling large language models? Uh, you mentioned there's a huge distance, right, between uh, you know reading <laughs> reading the paper that Aiden mm -hmm. co-wrote, <laughs> like doing hugging face, and then like you know you you have like a beta program and like a Discord with like a hundred thousand users. So tell us like mm -hmm. tell us like what. Like when it comes to at least training and scaling the large language models, what are some of the technical challenges that happen along the way? Yeah, so some of them I think are, are not too surprising. Like data is really important. I think, I think at this stage everybody kind of knows that. Like you really need to iterate on good data. And you need to do that for quality and usability of your model. And you also need to do that for safety. Um, mm -hmm. And those are things we, we iterate on a lot. Some of the other ones are maybe like more surprising. Just like when you're dealing with supercomputers at the level we're dealing with, um, there's just a lot of work that needs to go into like coordinating them all and making sure they're like set up correctly and communicating well and you have like good step time. Like that turns out to just be a really long process um, and takes, yeah, and, and, and you run into all kinds of little things that you didn't expect to be issues. Um, so it's just, it's just like a fundamentally at the end of it, like a lot of it's just an engineering challenge, like just a regular engineering challenge. Like any, like any, any doing any large compute at scale requires really dedicated engineering work. And this is no different. Hmm. Got it. Um, and so do you have any do you have anything in the works that you can talk about today? Um, and what what can we look forward to? Uh, what can we be excited about from Cohere? And obviously, you mentioned X, extra large is going to continue getting better uh, mm -hmm. within six months, right? So there's already one thing that uh, people can yeah. can keep, keep an eye out for. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, we got a lot of stuff in the works. So we're, we're iterating on on the generative model, the language generation model, and the embedding model. Um, the embedding model has gotten a lot better, too. And we're, we're recently, uh, yeah, we're, we're making a lot of progress on embeddings for semantic search and classification. Um, the other thing is we recently released, like, an API endpoint called co.classify. And that's, you know, that's back-ended by our generative and our embedding model. But it allows you to do 
few shot classification or fine tuned classification. And that is really kind of emblematic of the approach we want to take, right? Like you can build a classifier out of an embedding model. You can build one out of a generative model if you want to. Uh, but what we're, we're offering here with co.classify is just a way to make that you don't need to, you know, you don't need to know how those work in order to classify. You just need to give it a few examples and then call co.classify. And so it's a lot easier for a developer who's not particularly, maybe not even particularly interested in the way large language models work to solve a real world problem with them. So you can expect more stuff like that from us, like pushing out, you know, wrappers around these models to make them easier to integrate into real world problems. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, it's, I guess going back to like, also you were talking about language model for real world problems, you know? So mm -hmm. I guess classify is, is part of that, that goal, that larger goal of um, helping maybe make decision making at scale, helping to yeah. th those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I mentioned that is I think when a lot of people, you know, when the when the first GPT papers were coming out, people were saying, like, look, it can write a paragraph about a unicorn that can talk. And, like, that was really cool and very fun to read. But, like, it turns out, you know, we actually don't need language models to generate many paragraphs about unicorns. Like, that's actually not super useful. But, you know, getting a language model to read a, you know, a contract and pull out the start date of that contract or reading a job posting and pulling out, like, the skills like the, the, the skills that they're looking for out of that job posting or the title of the job, like those are all really useful things. Like the things that language models are actually really amazing at and that I you know, see a future of is like they're kind of boring. Like a lot of the things it's really good at, they're kind of mundane and people don't want to do them. They would much rather have a computer do them. And that's where language models are, are amazing. Um, so those are like real world problems I'm talking, like that kind of daily mundane stuff that if we can automate would make people's lives better. And that's what... You know, that's that's where large language language models I think can can succeed. Awesome. Okay, so now uh, we're going to get maybe into some more broader questions. Uh, mm -hmm. This is all very helpful, by the way, uh, and thank you for sharing, giving us more context about Cohere. Um, so you know you're in the space. Uh, you know you're very, obviously very active, deeply in the trenches. Um, you know, but I imagine you also get to take a step back a lot. Right. Um, and, you know, you and I have like I've been covering this since 2020. You've been in this probably even before me um, this year, 2022. How would you say this space has evolved? Uh, what, are, what are some things you've observed? Uh, the good, the bad, the interesting things, you, you know, you didn't foresee. The, the space of, of language modeling or the space of ML? Uh, as, as like language model, multimodal model and, and as far as ML. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the big thing is the image generation stuff. I think uh, is that's a that's a pretty new thing, and now there's a ton of different offerings for them. You know, there's like mm -hmm. there's lots of different people releasing good image generations models, and it's been really cool to see the artistic applications of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big change. Otherwise, I think you know, language models are just becoming more accessible and more ready to use. Like we're you know mm -hmm. we had this crazy technology, and and we're slowly working on making them being yeah ready to deploy. Uh, and they're getting a little closer, and that's that's like that's the the story of this year. I think is you know we have this really raw power, mm -hmm. and we're slowly honing it in into something that's like actually usable, um, mm -hmm. and that's and that's not just in language modeling. Like that's also in image generation. You know, like people have been mm -hmm. doing image generation for a while. Like one of the things I worked on at Google was using an image generation model for generating like uh, music videos, and that mm -hmm. was back in two thousand and like eighteen or something. Mm -hmm. And the images are terrible. Like they made a horrible music video. Like it was fun <laughs> to do, but like it's not good. And then you know, fast forward a little bit, and suddenly it, it, it's great. And it's you know, I guess actually this you know, diffusion is a new thing that wasn't being done at the time. But like it's not yeah. conceptually, it's not that different. It's just like hard engineering work that went into it, and you know, a lot of effort. And now we've got a bunch of different models that are all great and doing cool stuff. So mm -hmm. certainly an exciting time. But I think like the general theme is take this stuff that you know was demonstrated to be functional a while ago put a lot of engineering work into it and turn it into something useful. And that's what we're doing with language. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I will add now some of my observations. So um, I, I felt the Instruct Series stuff from OpenAI in January was was pretty significant to the language model mm -hmm. space um, for, for a variety of reasons. But uh, I've already talked about it in the past, so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time mm -hmm. on that. I agree with you on the image generation stuff. And actually, I wanted to just say, like, I think these image models drive people to language models. I think most people's exposure to this world 
yeah. will be first an image model, then maybe a coding model, or maybe they start with a coding model instead of an image model, and then to a language model. Like, I, if I had to sort of say there's like a pecking order. Um, yeah, I could, I could see that. I think the, I mean, the image model stuff just makes such good tweets. You know, like it's just <laughs> the image model yeah. stuff is so fun to play with. I mean, I, yeah. like I myself, you know, I, I released a while ago. I released a website for generating Magic: The Gathering cards. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we generate, and that that has had, I think, maybe like more than two million cards have been generated on that at this point. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, like that, without the image model, it's not as fun. Like the image model, yeah. really, really, it's like the the cherry on top that makes the experience fun. So I, I wouldn't be yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if you're right. I think it's like you know what are the real world application for image models. Yeah. Like, I don't think as many as for language. Like, I think language will solve problems people don't want to do, and images mostly solve problems people kind of do want to do, actually. People like making art and want to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, I think you're probably right in that, that trajectory. I, I think it's it's about eyeballs, like all these things. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to distill, like, the, the beauty of, like, an industry and word of mouth to just... But the thing is, like on Twitter, probably what millions or billions of people have seen an AI generated image by this point, either from yeah. Dolly 2, Dolly Mini, Midjourney, yeah. any of the things that are out there. And it's just a matter of time till these people hear about or question, is, does this exist for text, right? Mm -hmm. Or are they, they're, they're more sold on AI capabilities in ways they weren't before, right? Like I remember people didn't take uh, any of the language model seriously in 2020 because they were using Siri mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. all these other tools, yes. right? Yeah. Which were like, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I agree with you that the image model stuff, like I, I believe the space is going to get bigger between now and next mm -hmm. year for language like 10 times. Uh, I actually am a strong believer actually in, in schools. Like I, I think students will use these language mm -hmm. models far more. It's a market I'm, I was really excited about. I made a prediction about last year for, for 2022. Um, as, like, I, as writing assistants or like, what do you mean? Yeah, like, like for, for if you got an assignment, if you're writing an essay, if you can't come up with a thesis idea, um, if you just start have writer's block, right? Uh, if, you, if you need an idea for a presentation or a slogan, for business students, if you're doing a SWOT analysis, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. and then typically, you know, things sell to students and then those students eventually go into the real world and they don't just use it, they will demand it. Like, I won't work here. Unless you have these access to these tools, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's another thing I'm thinking about. Uh, I got in a little bit of heat last week over some safety stuff. We're not going to get into that, but uh, I think there's more inherent safety risks this year, uh, more so than there were the past two years. You don't need to comment on that, but uh, that's another thing I, I'm observing this year. Uh, and the space has also changed in the sense that uh, I just think there's more people that are that are advocates, you know, like uh, 2020 onwards, it, it really felt like an uphill battle. And nowadays, like people are creating content about this stuff that aren't me <laughs> or Sandra. <laughs> or like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. like people and, yeah. and they just see it as like a tool. You know, they don't necessarily yeah. see it as something that we need to get the word out about this. Right. Um, and yeah. so. Anyways, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to hijack, but like, you know, the space and actually, sorry, one last thing, Nick, is I have, heard, I have observed a lot of the key AI people completely change their position on language models and scaling laws, oh. right? Like in ways, the same people who criticize it in 2020, I have observed them publicly sort of acknowledge them and use them more uh, or like see them as a serious part or part of some larger repertoire in ways that they were belittling it and sort of dismissing it in 2020. And again, you don't need to comment on that, but I felt like, a, I don't know, like I felt a larger shift in like the expert ML people who've been with it from the beginning that they started, they started becoming more open-minded this year in ways they weren't two years ago and in ways they were ridiculing us in 2020 mm. that I still remember uh, and I'm heard about. Um, yeah, a little bit, okay. I can tell a bit, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so the you know, space is also interesting. Like we have, we have memes now. So uh, my, uh, Michael, <laughs> he runs a podcast called The Inside View. He put together this meme sort of classifying different people across uh, alignment as well as scale. Uh, and so mm -hmm. there's um, for the for the audience listening, the scaling laws. Uh, it's a sort of a research paper that came out of OpenAI. Uh, the shorthand of the research paper is by increasing the parameter size, data count and training it longer with like compute time, 
uh, these models tend to generalize better. I put a huge asterisk beside that, but that's generally the idea. Um, and so this year I had a chance to meet with Ethan in Mila, uh, who is uh, who gets that label as a scaling maximalist. So uh, for people listening, this idea of scaling maximalism is just through scale, just through making these models bigger. Um, the model uh, will basically generalize beyond human capability, even superhuman capability. And that is sufficient enough to get to a goal like AGI or artificial superintelligence. Now, I don't I, like I'm butchering probably the nuance of what Ethan's point, <laughs> but he, he gets that rep. Um, and also scaling maximalism is like a lot of it. Like, I guess the, the belief in the community is that all these complicated ML problems that exist will be just solved under this umbrella or whatever of scale. Make bigger, problem goes away. <laughs> and so uh, while I have Nick here, I wanted to ask him, what are your thoughts on scaling law maximalism? What are the limits of scaling law maximalism? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so just so I, I, yeah, I understand the question here. Like there's, I guess there's a, a few things you talked about. One of them was like, one of them is, you know, will we solve every problem by just making, by taking the neural net, throwing more data and more parameters at it and training it for longer? Um, yeah. And the, like, will we solve every problem that way? And will we get to AGI? No, I don't think so. No, I don't. I don't think we'll solve every problem by just throwing more data and more parameters mm -hmm. and more compute at it. Um, I think we'll solve some problems, and I don't think we've. I think we'll. I think we will still over the next few years see models that are bigger than that were released before and that are mm -hmm. better at some things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I don't think we've saturated on the on the number, and that's I think a function of not so much like some theoretical claim on the number of parameters required to compute the function that needs to be computed to solve them, but more something more claiming on like you know the, the particular learning algorithms we have right now benefit from more parameters, and we haven't saturated entirely on that. On the like you know will this strategy alone get us to AGI and solve everything? Like, first of all, you know, I don't really think about, like, we're, Cohere's not an AGI company. And, like, I'm, I don't think a ton about AGI. Um, I think we can make really useful, good things now without solving general intelligence. Um, I think we can make tons of stuff that, like, improves computers, improve human computer interaction, solve all kinds of complicated problems around language um, without having an artificial general intelligence. Like, that's not where we're, like, we're not at Cohere set out to solve artificial general intelligence, we're set out to solve language. We're set out to like solve you know, human computer language interaction. Um, but even if we were set out to do that, I, yeah, then no, I still don't think, I don't think, I don't think scaling a lot, like scaling transformers alone will get us there. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. So, but a lot of them have to do with just like, you know, the one example of, of general intelligence that we have really people um, you know, we, we learn in a really different way than, than neural nets learn right now. And that, to me, seems important. It seems that, like, the way in which we learn, learn is particularly important to creating general intelligence. And, uh, yeah, so and I don't think scaling alone will get us there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would add, and I apologize to Ethan if I, if I butchered his point. <laughs> it's just to get that out there as well. But, uh, like, uh, the, uh, I, I, you know, like, it's, like... These models are very surprisingly good and interesting and the capabilities they have are so shocking. And like, I almost feel like we need to even just understand them better. Like how, yeah. what makes them work? You know, maybe there's some kernel or some essence there that is truly what we want anyways, right? Um, and I think they, they represent capabilities that we just didn't even think were possible, right? Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I'm necessarily a scaling law maximalist. I think I'm maybe like a scaling pragmatist. Right. Like, I think even if we even if we can raise like a bajillion dollars and scale to like 100 trillion parameters, wouldn't it be great if we improve the efficiency of the stuff we have today? If we like have like an efficient ML, a well understood ML before we like, uh, you know, burn through all this energy and server power. It's an interesting question. Like there's a science side of me that's like, wow, what, what would a 100 trillion parameter model be like? But in the meantime, it probably makes sense to be a little bit more pragmatic about it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like I, I don't uh, like. I think I, I think there was like a maybe the Big Bench paper. One of them sort of it sort of outlined these areas where like language models do not improve with scale, 
right? Mm. Um, I think OpenAI said something even about reasoning very directly. Like reasoning does not improve with scale. So, mm. um, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I think it's uh, you know maybe maybe there needs to be some public fund, billions of dollars, to just even answer the question, like like physics or something, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean there, you know, recently there has been you know the, the big. Uh, Big science people are kind of you know taking that like public approach to trying to answer those scientific questions, mm -hmm. which I think is really awesome. cool to see. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's people doing work there. Like I think you know I, I still think we need a few real like you know you know like Jeff still iterates. Jeff Hinton still iterates on MNIST. You know, like he wow. still is he still is running experiments. And I mean, when I was working with him, I was running experiments on MNIST. And I don't. I still think we need a few more MNIST breakthroughs. <laughs> Before we like, you know, get to the next stage of 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 artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. um, I still think we need a few more like fundamental changes to the way we're doing learning. Yeah. So I'm I'm happy that there's still people working on on really tiny networks to see if they can make them better. Mm -hmm. What What do you think is missing? What What do you think is missing today from our understanding? That's a good question. Um, like a like a lot, I think. Uh, yeah, like I mean, one of the big things is we just people are so much better at learning from low data. We're so like we're we're amazing at it. You can see an object once and understand how it looks entirely in three D. Um, and maybe that's a learned like that. Maybe that was a learned. I mean, that's a meta learning behavior that we have, and maybe we could learn that with just more parameters. But for whatever reason, it seems that we learn in a really different way. Um, it seems like, you know, there's, there's the embodiment issue, there's like motivation and all kinds of other things that we have that, that neural nets that you boot up onto a TPU and run for many iterations and then freeze and then boot up for inference. So like totally different. So yeah, I think, I think there's a ton we're missing. Um, but, but again, like that's the whole, you know, that doesn't bother me for yeah. making something useful because yeah. we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to make AGI. We're just trying to make something that classifies your text really easily and allows you to, mm -hmm. you know, you know, write up a, a draft of a sentence or a tweet or, you know, summarize information in a factual way or something like that. Like those are the type of things we're doing. And that's the type of stuff that actually neural nets are great at. Um, and that more data does help. It does seem like more data and bigger and bigger compute and yeah, bigger parameter counts helps. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's some, there's some sweet spot, like with mm -hmm. pragmatism and scale, uh, discipline and scale, focusing on the now and scale. Um, all these things. I, I mean, I just like at a theoretical level, maybe like just if you did have like a perfect AGI, uh, it could do everything. But then again, I think if you tell yourself that as an AI researcher, <laughs> you, you might not even come up with anything useful, right? <laughs> like, you know, and like maybe there, there is something about applications and applying things to the real world, right? Um, which is also why like the, I think the Instruct series is also significant. Like I, I think uh, applying this uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback um, made the model so much better and at least perceptually smarter and more capable yeah. and safer, right? Um, well, it made it a which, lot easier to use. And that was a really, for sure. cool, that was a really cool development. Yeah, and so maybe, you know, that is kind of like a step towards AGI in a way. I don't know, right? I don't, I don't want to quite say that, but at least perceptually, it, it feels mm. like uh, closer. So maybe there's something about being more application-driven you know, value driven in the real world that sort of can help help us along this way uh, to to get there. Um, so we're approaching the end end here. Uh, I wanted to ask you how how are you thinking about multimodal AI models? Uh, what excites you? What do you think about multimodal AI? Yeah, I mean, I think multimodal is a really cool idea. Um, I mean, I you know, right now we're we're a, we're a text we do we do text, but uh, you know, we 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 can do stuff in other modalities by first turning it into text. So, you know, like that, you know, we, uh, we've done stuff in audio where first we transcribe the audio into text and then we can do semantic search through, through podcasts and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we're approaching it from text right now, but our goal is to solve language. And I think we all agree that language is multimodal, right? Like, you know, you're, you, you have a podcast, but you put your, you are on video camera right now and you're going to put this on YouTube and we're not just doing this in text. Like you're not posting a transcript, you're posting the audio and then the video and that's because that's better for us like that you know the experience for a listener or a viewer is better with those other modalities because language is more than just a sequence of 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 uh, tokens you know language kind of is multimodal um so i'm i'm very 
excited about multimodal models. I think they're really cool. It's been very fun to see the image generation stuff. Like I have as a user, I have a ton of fun. I've tried all the APIs and I've, you know, I use, I use one of them for the magic. I use Bombo's API for the magic, the gathering thing. Um, it's very fun to play with. I, I think the real business applications, the real like, you know, economic things are still in text for now, but I don't know if that'll be true forever. Um, and it's very cool to see the development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for sharing. I, you know, it, it is interesting. The, uh, the level of interest and activity, like the, the people who use multimodal models are really into it. There's just mm -hmm. so much excitement, uh, about multimodal. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, it's a, you know, creative spirit, creative soul. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, honestly, like I, it's, I, I understand the value point that you're saying. Um, I, 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 t I do think though, like multimodal models will create a lot of value, you know, like mm -hmm. images and these things, like even today you might use a multimodal model to generate a concept and then you turn that concept into a real thing and then you sell that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you're right in the sense that language sort of binds everything, right? Like yeah. we would, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, these, uh, text image models without the, the text part. Without the text part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, no, I, it's exciting. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fan, I'm a real fan, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, we're just closing out here. So uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on Toronto? What do you think makes Toronto a special, unique place? And of course, you mentioned your serendipitous story, starting off at Snakes and Lattes. <laughs> um, but was there anything else, any reason? Why, how has the city inspired you? Yeah, I mean, I, lo I love Toronto. Um, it's where Cohere is based. We have people all over the world at Cohere. So if you're if you're listening to this and you're you're not in Toronto, that's not a barrier to joining us and working on mm -hmm. on large language models at Cohere. Mm -hmm. We have people everywhere. Um, but we're headquartered out of Toronto, and I really really like Toronto. And I think the reason why I like it um, is just that it's it's there's a there's like a bit of everything there. Like unlike some of the other tech hubs in the world that really are like kind of first and foremost tech cities. Toronto is a fully functioning, developed city with a great tech ecosystem. It's not a tech ecosystem with a city attached to it. Um, you know, like Toronto is a place where, you know, I, I can I play a lot of music in Toronto and there's an amazing music scene. Um, and there's people from all of, like the fact that it is, you know, it's often called one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And like, mm -hmm. that is amazing. Like, it's just such a fun place to be as a result of that. Like anything you want to do or eat or listen to or see, there's somebody in Toronto doing an amazing job of it and like sharing it with their community. So yeah, I, I really like it because it is more than a tech ecosystem. The tech ecosystem is amazing and the ML community in particular, um, as a result of like the stuff that Jeff and other people have done to build it up is phenomenal, mm -hmm. but it's uh, it's just a great place to live. Yeah, so I, I like it. I would encourage everybody to come. Come to Toronto, it's great, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and through Cohere, you may get a chance to visit as well, <laughs> like a yeah, nice yeah, yeah. Uh, travel park. Yeah, we so just, we just wrapped up our uh, we just wrapped up like a we brought everybody from around the world to Toronto mm -hmm. for a week and like hung out. And yeah. It was it was awesome to see everybody in person. So yeah, if you join in the next little bit, we'll do that again at some point. Yeah, there you go. Um, my thing with Toronto, it's it's an energy thing. Like I think you know, I I pull it into to Union Station, and I just feel away. I feel like I can yeah. be anyone, do anything, uh, whoever can help me get there is here. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, Toronto is, uh, is a big city, but everybody is still somewhat reachable. Right. I think with, yeah. you know, with the right, totally. the right ass, the right intros or whatever, um, they will at least make time for you in a typical friendly Canadian way. Um, yeah, I, yeah that's a really so, good point. Yeah. I think yeah. Know, other places where there's like, you know, there's a huge like hustle culture or there's a, you know, there's a lot of competition so Yeah, in Toronto. It feels like, yeah, if, you, if there's someone who you want to talk to, you probably can go talk to them and ask them how they're doing and what they think. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, the, the tech industry is like, uh, I'd say pretty dense in Toronto as well. Like I, I remember when I used to work at a startup, like my first day I was like, I, I went out after with everybody and just by chance, like the CEO of a company, like some major app was like sitting right across from me and he just like blended in. Uh, and so anyways, yeah. And then I guess with Toronto, you get like the, the AGO is not far, the ROM is not far. And mm -hmm. like, uh, you can not only get that tech talent and uh, informational density, but you also can meet just regular people who know nothing about our space. And I find yeah. that and refreshing. Yeah. Right? No, I talk to a lot of people on a weekly, like, uh, on a daily basis who really don't care about tech. <laughs> and that's lovely. 
Yeah, and you kind of get a sense like all these things to us. Like we we are in the bubble. We are the bubble, mm -hmm. and like it's just refreshing. Someone who knows nothing about it, like they they don't even know AI images are a thing. And like I'm like maybe too much on the hype side. Like I will approach people like, how do you not know this is a thing? And then yeah, yeah. I will get into like you know it's important. You should get on it. Blah blah. blah. Music is coming. Videos are coming. <laughs> you can be a director. You know you should sign up today. Um, and so. Yeah, it's nice to speak to real people. It's nice to get an interdisciplinary kind of view. And it's also nice, like when you meet people who don't use this stuff, you understand what are the gaps still in the systems? What What is the reason it hasn't penetrated 100% of the world? Because honestly, in 2020, I felt it is gonna penetrate 100% of the world. So part of part of the reason, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a pragmatist and I agree with you on this solutions value driven approach is we should address these things, right? And make it more accessible and make it, we, we should ex articulate these things and the benefits of them and why they're so interesting to people in a way that it gets ordinary people excited, right? And then we can fully penetrate the market. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, AI access and, and these things, and it's absolutely important. There's a lot of work done, but I also think you need like AI, like marketability. You need to be able to tell somebody about it and get them interested and articulate why it's beneficial to them. Uh, otherwise, even if we have a fully safe open source AGI or whatever, uh, people might not even use it, which would be the funniest, saddest thing in the world, <laughs> right? Uh, and so anyways, yeah, so go back to Toronto. Yeah, I, I encourage everybody to visit. Um, and uh, yeah, there's something special. I, I ever, honestly, this is going to sound cliche, ever since Drake, like something has happened with the city. That, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I mean like, Drake, uh... <laughs> I mean, it's not just great though. I mean, if you look at the top like artists of the past yeah. like, few years, yeah. like, so many of them are Torontonian. Yeah, uh, or it's, not, or from Ontario. Yeah, or Ontario, or Ontario, like, yeah, yeah man. No, um, I, gotta, I gotta hand it to Drake. He runs around the whole world and he tells people how great Toronto is all the time. So, yeah, like when Americans know what Scarlet Road is, <laughs> like when Americans yeah. like know these things that like you know this. Or even uh, uh, there's another like Brampton artist, uh, Tory Lanes as well. Like somebody asked me about Brampton that I was like, I was shocked. Like, how do you know about Brampton? What do you know about all these? What do you know about Square One? How do you guys know about Square One? Like, anyways, so Steel City, like, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. And and actually, while I have you, Nick, I, I do encourage you guys. I the the Toronto man's language support is lacking across the entire industry. So. I, I would like you to develop a technical benchmark to improve Toronto man's uh, slang and language support. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this could be a cool, cool sort of diplomatic. We could include that along with all the other languages and, and slangs. Just a small yeah, suggestion if for you. Wanna, if you want to fine tune a model for Torontonian <laughs> slang, you can, you can go on to go here and upload okay. a text file. Sorry. Okay. So I need to build the data set. I need to build yeah, the data yeah. set. A Toronto man slang, and then from there, yeah, fine tune that. Drake's released a lot of songs. Drake's released a lot of songs. <laughs> so it might be enough. Yeah. yeah, no, I just I need to hang out like uh, at Pearson, <laughs> or like hang out at Young Dundas and just record, like and then like transcribe it, anonymize it. Anyways, I'm not gonna get into this. This might be an interesting use case if anybody wants to make this and tag me. Um, anyways, yeah, and then so uh, th thank you so much uh, for being here, Nick. Was there you know any you know anything you wanted to plug? Uh, there's probably tons of interesting hard problems you guys are hiring right now like crazy uh if there's any you know specific engineering problems uh this is the audience uh, let them know uh how, how can other people help you yeah i mean we're, we're hiring on all like all the areas of, of engineering to be honest um from like you know people who've been working with language models at scale for years to front-end developers who are you know just just beginning to get interested in language modeling so wherever you are in your in your computer science journey, or if you're not a computer scientist, but you're interested in business development or sales or like, you know, we're, we're all over the place. Um, and we're, I'm really, I'm really proud of the team we've built. Like it's a really awesome great group of people that are like brilliant and friendly and accepting and welcoming and hardworking. And so, yeah, if you want to, if you want to join, join the team, drop a line uh, at cohere.ai. Yeah, join, join the team, check out the socials, check out the document, the, the well-illustrated documentation. Oh, yeah. You, got, you guys got a webinar coming up as well, I guess. Uh, I can't remember if that's Thursday or Friday. But uh, yeah, lots of ways, lots of ways to keep in touch with Cohere, uh, keep a sense. And I do recommend, you know, if you want to if you want a pulse of the space, if you want to get an idea like what's new, what's happening, what's the latest and greatest, you, you, you have to follow Cohere as well. So um, anyways, yeah, uh, thank you so much for being here, Nick. I want to also shout out Sandra. It was a pleasure seeing her on on Saturday. 
Uh, she's yeah, the best. Yeah, I saw on your Twitter. Yeah, she's doing. She's she joined not too long ago, and she's really hit the ground running and doing awesome work. Uh, yeah, incredible. So if you join our yeah. Discord community, you'll see her running a lot of events. Uh, yeah, yeah, so she's great. She's great to work. Yeah, Sandra and I. So she and for the podcast listener, Sandra's been on the podcast before. Uh, and oh, she just yeah, published a book and it was just like a, a flight thing like she's she just had it at back so it was awesome to meet her in person and also uh, mm-hmm. connect me with you so so we could make this happen and I'm sure she'd, she'd be here otherwise so shout out shout out to Sandra again and so anyways yeah uh, thank you again for being here Nick and one one final piece as well I just want to say so Nick and I had, had briefly chatted actually in uh, 2020 ish ish uh, we spoke briefly about uh, potential way to collaborate but anyways I just want to say Nick it's it's been tremendous to just see your growth man and just see you guys like yeah. and uh, by the way like I met when Nick and I spoke it was stealth <laughs> like it was like like uh, COVID ish lockdown stealth yeah. And I, yeah. one random thing is Nick was telling me he wants like a yard. <laughs> like he's like tired of like always being at home in a condo. Uh, yeah. And so anyways, yeah, just to, just to see somebody's growth local to the city and see the company grow and, you know, all, the, all these different things. See the space grow as well, right? It's, you know, mm-hmm. t- time flies. But anyways, yeah, I just I wanted to congratulate you, Nick. Yeah, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Thanks so much, man. And thanks for inviting me on and, and giving me the opportunity to, to chat. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. Uh, so, uh Thank you again, Nick. Uh, you guys know podcasts are available everywhere. Uh, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. You can follow me on YouTube, youtube.com slash future. My handles are the same on Substack or Twitter. I will see you in the next one. Thank you again, Nick. Okay, see you later. Bye, everybody.